we never had a real debate about FISA because the people who wanted warrantless surveillance of all of us still haven't told us why they wanted that power. You can have the power legally, we'll change the laws, but no, they prefer to leave the laws as is and break them. Why did they do that? The explanation to me always seemed that they wanted to eviscerate the rule of law on surveillance and domestic spying. That law breaking was preferable to law making because executive lawlessness was the goal. But of course you can't argue that. You can't come to the American people or to the Congress and say we would like to hit pause on the Fourth Amendment for the duration, okay? We're really over this whole constitution, Americans have civil rights thing. <laughs> you, you can't bring that argument to us, so instead you just do it without saying why you're doing it. On torture, they said it's to get life-saving information, right? But we know that torture doesn't work, it produces false confessions. If you've got a ticking time bomb, why would you think that you could afford to waste time ripping wrong information th uh, through someone's fingernails without, uh, with pliers? On offshore prisons, they said they're there to protect us, but they are extra legal, so no one is prosecutable, so anyone they ever have to let out of one of those cages for any reason ends up having to be set free without charges. On signing statements, they said it's to protect the constitutionally given authority of the president, but their unitary executive theory of what the Constitution says, in my mind, is written in invisible ink on some imperial, autocratic, fantasy, choose-your-own-adventure, legal sci-fi novel that they market to Jerry Falwell Law School initiates. <laughs> while, while the power that would be, that, that, that is eviscerated by those signing statements happens to be something that we call the power of the Congress to make laws. That power, in contrast, is written by Quill with ink on hemp in Article 1 of the Constitution. <laughs> hiring private armies, the argument was um, cost effectiveness. Right? With base level hired guns making double General Petraeus's salary. Why do they say they are arming the government of Pakistan? The, 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 the nation that hosts Osama bin Laden and quarters both Al Qaeda and the Taliban. Supposedly it is because we are fighting Al Qaeda and the Taliban. The arguments that were put forward to support these policies don't make sense. They are lamely and sputteringly irrelevant. They are materially unrelated to the actual policies. Because the actual anti-democratic, anti-constitutional, radical things that really do explain why we did these policies are not ready for prime time, we instead <coughs> got nonsense, non sequitur, unrelated distractions instead of actual debate. Your indefensibility meter has been redlining for eight years. And that is Good news, in the, in the end, because indefensible policies can't last. We were temporarily bamboozled by the irrelevant non sequitur arguments that have been thrown around concerning these policies, but in a country that loves the Constitution, and that loves our divided system of government, and that really does want to prevent the next 9-11, and frankly, get the people who attacked us last time. In this country, indefensible policies can't last, and they, and they won't last. We shall restore habeas corpus. We shall restore the powers of the Congress. We shall restore our place in the community of nations that reject barbarism and war crimes. We shall restore ourselves as a symbol to the world of the glory of the rule of law and not of man. will do that is because the arguments that say we shouldn't do those things are dumb and unpersuasive <laughs> and these are indefensible policies. And so the party that represented the worst of these policies got clobbered in the last two elections. And so the new president is a constitutional law professor. And so the new president, a constitutional law professor, has unexpectedly found what the bird-dogging annoyance of the day, the what you're bringing that up again can't get away from this issue of his transition and his early presidency, to his surprise, is the unrelenting demand from way more quarters than he expected that criminal behavior in the former administration would be prosecuted. And so we read the fine print and we look for the asterisks on his rendition and torture executive orders. Sometimes we even do that on primetime cable television now. 
And, and, and so there is now an actual debate this time on what we will do in Afghanistan and what we will not do and why. And so the State Department rises from the administrative ashes and the Pentagon might actually start to shrink and we might actually start to build godforsaken American infrastructure again. It is happening. Uh, the bamboozling and the, the smoke screens could only work for so long. We are smarter than that and we are committed to our country and, and we do this neat thing where we form independent membership-based advocacy groups to defend the Bill of Rights and to sue the heck out of the government <laughs> when they get on the wrong side of the government. You know, in the, in the No Lost Causes campaign, we won. Um, Mississippi dropped its segregation policy. Alabama mostly dropped its policy as recent as, recently as last year. They were still in the process of undoing their dumb parallel system for prisoners with HIV. Um, but they are dropping it. And that No Lost Causes campaign worked because I really believe um, that in America, if you are clinging to some indefensible, unconstitutional, bad idea of a policy, Ultimately, one day, you are going to look up from the front gate of your prison, and there on the horizon, <laughs> oh my god, there will be the ACLU. <laughs>